Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by our partners at GameSite. GameSite provides full-service campaign management, taking charge of consulting, influencer discovery, relationship management, billing, and reporting, leaving you free to focus on your core business. With their measurement platform and creator-focused programs, GameSite helps brands grow, increase revenue, and ensure player satisfaction worldwide. And since the company draws from almost a decade of battle-tested experience, including with notable customers like Bungie, Capcom, Ubisoft, and hundreds more, GameSite's attribution platform meets the unique needs of PC, console, and Web3 games. Notably, GameSite brings display, social, influencer, and affiliate marketing into one dashboard for easy comparison. Marketing attribution for PC and console games is complicated, but whether your game is free to play, premium, or supported by DLCs, GameSite has you covered. To learn more about how GameSite has served other games teams and how it can help yours, simply visit gamesite.io or check out the link in the show notes. And with that, let's jump into the episode. So welcome, 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 everybody, to another packed episode of the Navic Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Manu. And if I sound slightly unwell to you, uh, then it's because I'm still recovering from a pretty major cold uh, from last week. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why it's taking so long uh, to recover fully, but my apologies in advance for sounding little stuffy and maybe nasally. (laughs) Anyway, uh, you know, that doesn't mean we cannot do a podcast. uh, And I'm super excited about today's episode because we will be diving deep into the topic of community in game building. I won't attempt to list out all the ways uh, leveraging community can help one build better games because there are really so many. But Moreover, we have two guests who can talk about all things community way better than I can summarize. Colin Feo and Richard Warren. Colin is the CEO uh, and Richard is the head of community at Windwalk, which is a company focused on building digital communities and the technologies necessary to accelerate them. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So uh, let's kick things off with some uh, context for our listeners who might not be, you know, very familiar with both of you and Windwalk. We'll start with Colin. Um, If you could quickly go over your background, uh, maybe even touching on Windwalk's founding story and what Windwalk does today. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm Colin. Uh, As you mentioned, I'm I'm CEO here. Um, My background is originally from the game design side. So I was a game designer at Riot, working on League uh, for a couple of years. Then I went to go do some kind of VR work um, at a studio called Baobab, and then founded Windwalk shortly after that. Um, and you know, now we're kind of a big community agency, community SaaS product you know, kind of company, but we actually started out originally as a game studio. So um, the reason we kind of are so obsessed with community is we were founded as a game studio that's foundation was to be community first, you know, a phrase kind of everyone uses to describe their game studios these days. Right. Um, but for us is, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like who isn't community first. Right. Um, but you know, for us, it was pretty, a pretty specific strategy based on what we saw in the market, which was essentially the discoverability was harder than ever. You know, we saw, you know, the cost for influencer going up, we saw programmatic ads kind of collapsing, um, or getting expensive. And, you know, we saw small games, medium-sized games, big games that were winning grow on the back of these huge organic communities, you know, usually built before launch. So um, yeah, we, we launched, you know, our first game enemy on board and we kind of, d- to, to, to TLDR our company story, we, we discovered a really unique kind of community go-to-market built around gamifying our Discord, gaining access mm-hmm. to our game, you know, our alpha build essentially for weekend play tests and tournaments. Um, and essentially having people like share, invite their friends, upload all our content posts, um, 
in exchange for a shot to get into those weekend tournaments. And it was a very, you know, from us, very caveman way of running this kind of community led go to market. But, um, you know, we've built on those strategies and we've grown, you know, a pretty thriving business out of that and, and have some exciting tech that kind of doubles down on those concepts coming out soon. So. Awesome. Yeah. Which, uh, which, uh, what is the name of the game? Uh, just out of interest. Yeah. Yeah. The game was, uh, the game is called enemy on board. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we've kind of given it back to the community. I think we, we realized we nailed the community growth part, but we couldn't get the LTV to work super well. Um, right. but you know, it, it proved out our strategy. Um, and if you were on Reddit in 2019 in any of the gaming subreddits, you probably saw all of our posts, you know, in our boards <laughs> of, of right. fans going and uploading all our stuff. So. Yeah. I definitely remember reading about the game, I think, in uh, Simon Carlos's uh, newsletter. Um, and I think it was, uh, that was probably also where I heard Winwalk for the first time. So, um, but yeah, uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, maybe uh, handing it over to Richard, if you could also quickly go over your background. Um, you know, what do you do at Winwalk today? Maybe who has Winwalk uh, worked with in the past and what uh, the process generally is also? Cool. So I, I joined Woodwalk as the first employee here um, in 2019, uh, sitting alongside Colin, Chris, and Sam, who are the kind of OG co-founders of, of Woodwalk. Um, and prior to that, I had been just kind of like giving advice from the sidelines and like trying to help out as much as I could, whether that be like, you know, helping them think through go to market or fundraising questions or anything like that. I was effectively just trying to trying to help out a group of people that I thought, you know, we're going to do big things. Um, and, you know, I got connected to Colin and Chris through Sam, who is one of my really great friends and, and a college roommate. Um, and so, yeah, basically joined the company as the first employee prior to starting at Winwalk. Um, I spent five years working in, in tech M&A. So actually doing sell side uh, M and A deals for different tech companies, a lot of SaaS companies, some gaming companies as well. That was a total slog, like definitely a grind. Uh, being an investment banker is really, really tough. But one of the things that is super important about it is like you take your job really, really seriously, um, right? So you know somebody is trusting you to sell their business for them, potentially kind of like a life-altering outcome. Uh, on, on the scale of hundreds of millions of dollars, not just for them, but for, you know, multiple generations of their family afterwards. Um, and you as an investment banker have to be there, you know, to steward them through the, through the process of, of, you know, actually selling their business. And so, yeah, you know, basically learned a ton of things doing banking, uh, was a very, very serious person, <laughs> was getting a little sick of, was getting a little sick of just kind of, you know, the, the mobility hurdles at, at banks, to be honest, like I you know, started as an analyst, moved up to associate, you know, would have had to work for multiple more years in order to become a VP and then, you know, director and MD and all this stuff. Stuff I really liked about it was ultimately connecting with, with, with different companies that we were selling um, and learning their businesses inside and out. Um, and I, I, I kind of felt like as you progress in that field, all you really start to do is focus on sales, right? You're starting to bring in more companies and you, know, you don't really still get the opportunity to dig in as much as, you, as you'd like. Like that just gets reserved for analysts and associates to make models and make decks and stuff like that. So the, the aspect that I really loved about banking was starting to slowly go away. Um, and I, you know, throughout that time, I had very much set my sights on gaming. You know, I'm a lifelong gamer, played a ton of games growing up. You know, one of my favorites is actually uh, Wind Waker, like from, from Zelda, um, one of my favorite, favorite games. Um, so it's funny that, you know, ended up working at a place called Wind Walk. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but, uh, so, so yeah, you know, I, I, I started, started working on enemy on board as head of community and really running growth. And we had very little marketing budget for the game. We had, we had just gone through Y Combinator, um, had raised like a tiny bit of money, but ultimately had, a uh, pretty small budget dedicated to enemy on boards marketing. And what we saw was all of these other indie game companies, right. Using platforms like Reddit or Twitter, you know, using creators, you know, to, to spread the message of their game. And we kind of naively jumped in, 
headfirst to kind of figure out what are the right strategies for us to take. And it became very obvious that building an awesome community around our title was going to be the winning strategy for us. We wanted, you know, 10, 20, 40,000 people, you know, all collected inside of a discord, you know, with connected emails, you know, connected Twitter handles, things like that, that we could easily notify about all the announcements, all the content that we're pushing out so that effectively those people would become evangelists for us um, and help us break through different algorithmic discovery hurdles that, you know, are, are, are prevalent on pretty much every social platform. So yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that. We had a lot of success building Enemy on Boards community from zero to, you know, 40,000 people in, in uh, 2019, 2020, prior to our early access launch. And uh, the work that we did for Enemy on Board was very much foundational to us building the technology that Colin kind of alluded to um, in terms of gamifying different things and providing people rewards for taking, um, you know, growth positive social actions. Um, funneling that into like a core incentive structure, like I want to play testing key. So I'm going to retweet everything that you guys push out, or I'm going to up, upload all your Reddit content. So that, that was, you know, foundational for us to build our technology, but also foundational for us to kind of build our go-to-market approach, um, where, you know, that's effectively, uh, my position now where we work with different partner companies, everybody from big game studios, um, big music labels, um, and small indie studios as well that really, really are focused on, on building community and, and starting to effectively, you know, build evangelism around the product. A lot of the work that we do uh, sits in Discord as a, you know, kind of centralized, I would say, hub for community. But our view around community is very much that it's, you know, multi-platform. People have different social tendencies. People have different social incentives that they need um, in order to engage. So community is not just having a Discord um, Discord for us very much is a launch pad for a lot of other different socials. Um, so it's a great place to kind of aggregate the audience. And so we, we help companies effectively set up, build their discords, um, help, help them set up evangelist programs, whether those be creator programs, community member incentive programs, um, and engagement loops, um, and really just help them kind of go to market, um, uh, based on, based on, you know, the growth of their community and, and, and pushing that forward. So shortly after we launched Enemy on Board, you know, we were in early access for six months. I think we had half a million downloads on the title. So definitely something meaningful for us, especially with a, you know, very minimal marketing budget. Um, we just started getting a lot of inbound from people asking us to do the service work for them. You know, not enough tr- trained and talented community people in the, in the world, not enough growth oriented community people in the world. Um, so people started coming to us and asking us for help, whether that be, you know, using our deep knowledge on Discord or just our ability to understand what's happening on broader social platforms as well. So we launched yeah. that business about two years ago. And uh, yeah, I work with all of our clients now, helping them think through all this and actually execute on their community, you know, go to market plans. Yeah, I, th- I think like a really cool thing to realize there is like, like the moment we we launched Envy on board, like we essentially showed that like that that go to market to to some people, and it was it was not a huge game, but yet again we were like punching way above our weight class. You know, we're four dudes in a living room with a ten thousand dollar marketing budget who launched a free to play game on PC with five hundred thousand downloads. Right, like that got kind of kind of like raised some noise for us, I guess. Um, but you know, the really exciting thing that happened was that there was kind of some of these companies out there, some of these startups in particular who saw what we were doing and they were like, Hey, community isn't just for product feedback anymore. Community, you know, isn't just for you know, customer service, let's say, but they view it as a way to grow a way to kind of go to market. Right. Um, and since we've started doing that work yet again, we kind of had people knock our door down saying like, Hey, what you did for enemy on board, can you do it for us? We've only like kind of felt that volume increase, right? People are changing the way they build their games now to involve community earlier, and the impetus for them being for doing that is them realizing it's a growth thing, right? Like we've all known communities can help with product feedback. We've known they can help with customer service, but when people like change the way they build their game from like having one build every three months to a build every month, so we can start running play tests, so we can grow a community, you know, when they start like comfortable sharing more about their product earlier, you know. 
that's because they're ultimately excited about a bunch of users breaking through discoverability, all these like existential problems that game studios right. deal with these days, right? Um, right? And so it's kind of a story of like, I don't know, in some ways I always say we're the worst entrepreneurs in the world because we were doing this work and we had like a bunch of people knocking on our door. They were like, hey, can you do this for us? And finally we're like, yeah. And they paid us for it. <laughs> we're like, <laughs> like, we walked into a business, right? But um, yeah, I mean, we, we've seen one company in a hundred Last year, 20 company, companies in 100. Now it's like 60 companies in 100. And they're starting to get senior level com- growth-minded community leadership in these places. So it's it's very much a tidal wave, I think, um, which is exciting. So Nice. Any uh, any specific clients or games that uh, you guys could mention where, you know, uh, we, could, we could kind of uh, see the impact of your work uh, with the community growth? Yeah, I mean, so our... You know, our engagements are very, like, especially at the execution level, are, are very different for, for the most part, like across clients. People come to us wanting different things. So I think one kind of like at the indie gaming level, which is indicative of, you know, one of the types of works that, we, uh, one of the type of work that we do um, is around a project called Fuzzy Bot, um, which is, you know, the X Dice people making an awesome, you know, co op action roguelike, uh, online co op action roguelike. This is the Bitcraft, uh, funded studio, I believe, right? I think so. Um, they came to us, you know, asking to effectively start helping them think through their playtesting loop and build a community of people that, you know, we could, st- you, they could start getting feedback from in like an early kind of NDA closed pre-alpha, right? Um, and so what we did is, you know, we, we went out to Reddit, you know, our roguelikes, our roguelites. We found a bunch of co-op games, right? That people were playing Deep Rock Galactic, Sea of Thieves, right? Trying to understand this co-op gamer behavior, like how people actually play these games. Um, we started engaging on, on Reddit and Injure for the most part, building up content around the roguelike genre and ultimately funneled a lot of those people directly into the Fuzzy Bot community discord where, you know, they signed an NDA, were able to, you know, play test the game. And really we took their community from what I would call zero to one, which is something that a lot of people ask us for, right? I have no idea where to start building my community. I don't know how to get my first a hundred members, let alone 5,000, 10,000 members, right? People that are actually going to, you know, be excited about my product. And so we basically helped fuzzy bot build a, I think it was like six, 7,000 person discord over the course of like two months. Um, help them run through playtesting, the feedback loop, incentive structure around rewarding, and you know, referral for users because we wanted to make this be like a, you know, co-op experience so people could invite their friends. Um, and that was a really interesting and fun engagement for us because it was very similar to the work that we had done with, with Enemy on Board, like, you know, building right. engagement and building engagement on other social platforms, funneling those people into Discord, gamifying the playtesting access process, you know, to focus on sharing. Um, so that's like definitely one type of engagement where it's like really zero to one. Um, the other types of engagements that we tend to handle will be things like, you know, communities are, you know, totally inactive or dead. Right. So people come to us and are like, yo, I don't know what I need to be doing in order to revive this community. Right. Or in order to actually utilize this community. Um, and we have a whole host of case studies around this. You know, I think one of the, one of the ones that we've been working on and are still working on continuously is, is a Web3 game called Mojo Melee um, from the Planet Mojo team. And, you know, they, they came to us with, you know, 100,000 person Discord or something like that. Um, you know, 500 people online at any given time. So extremely botted, <laughs> as, you'd, right. as you'd expect in Web3 and, and people not really yep. like engage it, right? Um, and so, you know, we've, we've really helped them drive up, drive up engagement substantially inside their community, um, basically by pruning bots inside the server and then really digging down into the actual incentive structure that's going to get the people in there to care about being members of the community, right? So right. one of the big things that Web3 games do really well is they, you know, they release stuff early. They go to market with their community, right? Maybe many years before they're even releasing a game. But they understand that avatars, profile pictures are congruent to digital identity, right? So 
you know, if you can build a digital identity inside your community early, that's really, really important. So that was one of the first steps that we wanted to take with Planet Mojo was, hey, let's let's take these Mojo seeds that you guys have have basically sold to the market. Let's get some sort of digital identity going inside the community so people can have Mojos as their PFPs, have their favorite Mojos. They can talk about these things on Twitter. They can talk about these things on Discord. Um, and we've had a great amount of success effectively changing up the way they've been doing community management, focused very deeply on the players that actually play the game, right? Not just speculate on the Web3 assets. Um, and that's been a, been a huge success for us. So that's, you know, I think right. the secondary yeah. item that people come to us for, which is like this community remediation. I don't know, there's some community like revival, I think people that, that come to us for. Um, and then I think the third third one where people, you know, tend to, to employ our community services is really, you know, we've already gone zero to one. Maybe we have a small community already. How do we activate that community to, to share like crazy, right? How do we get that community to onboard new members in there? Um, and so that's effectively like a one to 100, you know, style engagement. Um, and a good example of that for us would be somebody like Limit Break where, um, you know, they came to us with a launch project, Digi Daigaku, uh, ravenous, um, ravenous group of people that wanted a Discord community. And we effectively implemented a, a really great, you know, incentive loop through, you know, our, our Discord bot and our web tools and stuff like that for users to share, get rewarded and grow and, you know, ultimately grow. So, you know, that's been cool. I think we joined that project when they had, you know, 25,000 members following their, you know, their social handle, you know, that's close to 300,000 now. And then on, on Gabe's main account over a million. And a lot of that's obviously driven by huge marketing announcements like Super Bowl and tons of crazy yep. stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah. from, from our perspective, what matters is having those big marketing beats and a community that's willing to go talk to them, talk about them online, right? You can do tons of crazy things like have a big Super Bowl commercial, but if no one's going to talk about it, you know, on socials or in your discord, you know, why are you even doing it? So, you know, we've been very happy with that engagement and our ability to take all the incredible marketing work that their team is doing, bring that back into some, into the community and have people effectively spread and evangelize that, you know, for, for, for limit break. And that happened with Digi Daigaku that happened with Gabe's account. Now that's happening with their new royalty solution, ERC 721 C where, all you can see on Twitter, if people are talking about royalties, is a bunch of people from the Limit Break Digi Daigaku communities chilling ERC 721C and talking about why this is a better protocol for people to to employ. So, um, right. yeah, those are a, those are really kind of like the three main engagement types that that, that we it. that we handle for people. You know, separately, there's like advisory work where we just help them kind of strategize around community. Um, and that's something that, you know, we've been doing for a little while now and has been quite fun for us. Uh, definitely puts my like investment banker hat on like that involves like presentations and stuff. So I have to like right. make points <laughs> again. Um, Got it. But uh, yeah, you know, people come to us for that as well. So those are the, those are really the things that we do on the community. Uh, All right. Community side of things. Cool. So yeah, so I guess yeah. To summarize, there's the zero to one style projects. There's the existing community driving engagement projects, and then there's the growth projects, and then there's like an ancillary advisory uh, on the side. So great. Yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, that's uh, that's a good uh, you know good rundown of uh, Windwalk. So uh, listeners should be like pretty uh, up to date now about what you guys do, who you've worked with, and also yeah, potentially see you know some of the impact. Uh, of the work that you've done in the communities, uh, in the game communities that you mentioned. But um, yeah, I think let's dive into then today's topic of discussion. Uh, so that is building hits with the power of community. And, you know, there are really so many interesting angles to this topic. Uh, and we'll try to cover a lot of ground uh, on this episode. But the reason we're talking about community community today is pretty simple. Uh, it has always been important. And I'd say it has never been more important. And especially when thinking about, you know, where the industry uh, is moving from a discoverability, distribution, product road mapping, UGC, or even Web3 perspective. Uh, but 
everyone also thinks about community differently. So let's start with a more fundamental question. And maybe Colin, uh, this one is for you. Uh, what is community? <laughs> Can you define it for us? And yeah, also, yeah, what yeah, is yeah. it not? Yeah, I think I think tons of people, you know, yeah, everyone has their own little little definition. But I think for me, you know, it, it's fundamentally people engaging with your product outside of just using your product, right? So we think of like fandoms, right? If I love a game character enough, I'm going to go create fan art, and then I'm going to go share it somewhere, right? Or I want to talk strategy in a game, or I want to meet other people to play with, right? Um, you know, these are kind of functions we see communities fill. Right. But usually, you know, it's those people who want to organize with others outside of your product. And this is why community exists not only in games, but in music and uh, with influencers. Right. Now, we actually do also work with, you know, increasingly with like music labels. Um, we're starting to work with some really large influencers because it's, it's the same problem. Right. You know, people who love, I don't know, let's say Pokimane right, are going to go into her discord and they're going to want to spend time with other people who are fans. They're going to take part in actions there. You know, if you're launching a game, what people are going to be doing in your community and your definition of community will change over the course of the life cycle of your product, right? Um, but fundamentally, if you have a bunch of crazy lunatics who love what you're doing, who are you know self-organizing or joining your formal official community, um, it's a powerful force. Find a way to harness that. Find a way to 10x, 100x the amount of those people that exist and get them to go do things that let the thing that they love grow your product, right? So to be very much more specific to, um, this tends to be on Discord and Twitter for a lot of games, maybe like Telegram for Web3 stuff, but those communities tend to be somewhat short-lived. They kind of have like a Twitch chat problem. It's just it's hard to be an engaged member for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, right now the DuJour tools are Discord and Twitter. Twitter kind of your push notifications and async, Discord your synchronous communication. How about Reddit? Reddit's great. Um, Reddit kind of like Discord doesn't really have a discoverability arm to it, right? Like it's just not very reasonable anymore for something from your subreddit to get onto the front page. Just like on Discord, you're going to be driving people into your Discord, word of mouth is, right? And so Reddit is great. You can have a community fracturing problem early, right? So what we, we tend to see is that games post-launch that have scaled will have very active Reddit communities. We find that less common pre-launch because there's kind of a concept of wanting to focus all your laser beam, right? You know, if you split your attention, you'll have some people in this community and some people in this community. And, you know, the ultimate value a community pro like provides for people is the ability to meet other fellow fans. So you can have like a concurrency problem. Um, and so we don't tend to do a lot of subreddit work early. Um, you know, owned community work. But that being said, other subreddits out there, especially general interest ones, will go find appropriate ways to spread the good word about a community we're working on in those places. So, yeah, um, it's also a demographic thing, and we can dig into that later. But each one of these platforms is going to have kind of a prime demographic where you're going to have users who are most familiar with the tools. Like we've all had those friends who have tried to use Discord, and it's insane. Right. They're like, I don't even know where to go. But for certain mm -hmm. generations, especially younger generations, they're like natives. Right. And so they're going to want to go join a community where they're most comfortable on the tools that they're most comfortable. Yeah, I guess, yeah, that, that kind of lays like a good foundation and we can start to dive a little bit deeper now. So when when I was kind of thinking about, you know, how to structure this uh, conversation, I kept coming back to how multiple aspects of community live on different spectrums. Um, and so let's start with, you know, first discussing like the first spectrum or uh, we can just call it like the x-axis <laughs> of this, which is community launch time. And so Richard, you know, there are, there are of course two sides uh, to the spectrum. There's games launching communities pretty early and the others launching it pretty late. And both work in, you know, different contexts and scenarios. Uh, but in your opinion, um, when, when do you think is kind of a good time to launch a community? What are the criteria to consider when thinking about, you know, community launch time? And maybe you could even hit on like more tactically, how does one kind of execute on this more early versus late approach? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and actually something that we get fairly often is like, when should I launch my community? Um, so yeah, I think what we tend to tell projects uh, that are looking to launch, you know, their communities is, is, you know, what are the reasons why somebody is going to 
actively care about being a member, right? Um, if you don't have reasons for people to be there, right? Why are you, for example, wasting your time setting up a discord? Because all you want in discord is real time chat. You want people chatting and engaging and connecting with one another all the time. And if they have nothing to talk about, you know, then why launch a discord, right? Just launch an email newsletter. Um, and so I think it, it, the, the question is really, you should launch a community when you're ready to service the different platforms that you want to be building on. Um, I think that indie studios and smaller games teams that don't have big marketing budgets and, for example, aren't getting their trailers on the Game Awards or covered by huge creators right off the bat, um, maybe they don't have spend for that. Um, it's, it's vitally important that you, know, you, build your, you start building your community probably like yesterday. Um, one of the big challenges that we see, um, one of the big challenges that we see, you know, studios, studios have is actually like, what are the things that, what are the things that are going to captivate interest for my users? And I think you can get really, really creative from a content angle to keep people entertained and engaged. Um, and so, you know, a lot of different communities that, you know, we're working with, particularly on the indie side, right? We'll hold off on, on launching, for example, a Discord early for them, but we will launch a pre-reg signup, right? Users will, you know, connect their Discord ID, their Twitter handle, maybe the Reddit handle. We can kind of create like a unified CRM, you know, with, you know, their email is associated with it as well. Kind of like a unified CRM of all the people that are maybe interested in your, in your title or your brand, right? You can, you can start thinking about each of the different pages that you have, the different you know, parts of your company as assets. Think about how you can build audience behind those assets. Um, a really great example of somebody that's like building, that started building, um, started building uh, kind of like a brand identity before they launched a community, like a real community on Discord. Um, I think, was it, is it Mike Morheim's studio, Colin? Um, yep. That's doing the, the StarCraft, you know, next version of starcraft oh god there's a couple studios doing that right um so yeah i mean there'd be M mike morham i think is bonfire but uh i know the folks over at frost giant have done a really good job of also building their brand early. i think it's frost giant that's the one um position themselves yeah. as experts in the rts space right before they've announced before they announced their game now they've announced it but yeah right and, and, and tactically before they had like anything to show right they posted an they posted you know a bunch of press and got people you know into a newsletter and you know, onto a Reddit page, people are speculating about what's going to happen. And they started feeding monthly content to those people, like little dev blog notes and stuff like that. And it can be as simple as that, right? So, you know, I, I think the question ultimately is kind of like pushback to the, to the developers, which is, or the publishers even, um, which is when do I have enough stuff to share? And what is my plan to actually share this with the community? Because what you don't want is a passive community that is maybe it's actively growing and bringing in organic traffic, but those people are seeing something that's not engaging. You know, they'd much rather spend their time inside of a community where they can chat and connect with people, um, you know, live maybe on discord than for example, a, a dead discord or something like that. So I think it's really all about having enough to keep people excited and understanding what are the different kind of like steps in getting to a big community launch. So, you know, when we're thinking about when we're going to launch somebody's Discord, for example, we definitely don't want to do that when you don't have content to share. We probably want to do that. The earliest time we want to do that is probably when you're gearing up to play test, right? You can have like a really exclusive Discord that's just for selected play testers. Maybe they've gone through pre reg and you can service them really well. All they're going to be talking about is the game, sharing clips of the game in there giving you bug feedbacks and they get, to, you know, they get to connect with one another because they're all playing this game and feel like they're an active part of the development of it. The, the question I think can kind of, the question is, is a tough one, but it's really like when you have enough stuff to share and when you have a good plan for the different pieces of content that are going to live on each of the platforms that you want to build community on. So and the general yeah. feedback that we give is I indie studios that. do it now, bigger publishers, yeah. right. Or you have, more arrows in your quiver, right? You can do it later, but you should get started now. 
anyway. Yeah, so I think like, and that, that's like the answer, really like Manu, your question was really specific, which was once you start building your own community. But like when we think broadly about community and how it can actually help a studio or a publisher, like what Richard's saying is absolutely correct. So like once you have, creating your own community is kind of like having a child in some ways, right? Now you have all these responsibilities, you have to take care of it, right? And it can bring you great power, right? You could scale it up. You could, you know, maybe that very public success and engagement could help you do BD work. You know, maybe you get all those people to start retweeting and boosting all of your marketing beats, right? And you're this huge larger than life product. But if we take community as a discipline, there's other things that, other than just owned community. So like, what are the big existential questions that a game studio or a publisher have to deal with? You know, am I going to green light, red light building this game? Am I going to get my financing or my publishing deal lined up, and then I'm going to launch my title, right? Community can help with all these things. So a quick example, we, we have a second title. We have, we have a games arm, and we have a second title in production right now that we've placed with a publisher. We saw, used community to solve those three problems on that path. We're going to be launching it next year, right? Um, so we don't have tons of, you know, we don't, we don't have exact data on that yet, but green light, red light, you know, we wanted to build a roguelike title pretty crowded red ocean genre, right? Yeah. Um, what we actually did is, you know, we essentially said, look, if we're just gonna build a roguelike just like any other studio doing it, it's pretty hard for us to put our money into that, our time, our effort, our focus. We don't know anything that other people don't. We don't know what, those audi- what that audience wants. We're kind of just gambling on our own creative output. Um, so what we did is we built a community on Discord, a general interest community, not affiliated with Winwalk, for co-op and roguelike gamers. And we essentially said, hey, Come in here. We're we're going to do like best in class, you know, large public Discord stuff. We're giving away games every week. We're helping people with LFG to meet other people to play. You know, we're running contests for other people's games in there. Through that, we built an audience of like ten thousand co-op and roguelike gamers. We interviewed them a bunch, um, and then we kind of came up with a game pitch, right? And we showed it to like I think two hundred, three hundred of them, um, and you know, we felt confident. In, in an actual pitch that was unique that addressed their unique problems. We felt like we were advantaged building in that space. So then we built an alpha for, you know, we greenlit it internally. We built an alpha build for it that was really janky. You know, we always say a build only a mother could love. And we showed it to that community. And then we grew a community for that alpha build, right? Um, that ended up getting into, you know, the five figures in size on Discord. Then we took all that momentum and we went and showed it to a bunch of publishers and did our publishing process. And we had a bunch of horses in the race and we had a really, really awesome pitch, right? Most people are like, here's a cool game. I want to build it. I'm credentialed. We said 10,000 people already love this to death, right? Um, then now that we actually have kind of the money lined up at a really kick-ass partner, now we're going to do owned community, right? We're going to build a community that we're going to grow and we're going to use those fans, get them really pumped. And we're thinking really consciously about when we want to launch that. To exactly Richard's point, right? Like, when are we ready to maintain momentum in that community? Because the goal of that community in that stage will be to amplify our launch. So this is where I'm saying kind of like a community solves a lot of problems for you. It's kind of a stupid buzzword in some ways, right? Um, but if you view it essentially as like, well, how are we building games and not knowing our customers super well or talking with them or involving them in development? They're ultimately the ones where you have to buy it. It's pretty powerful, right? Yep, um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, I, I thought like, um, you know, when I said launching a community early, I was uh, even, I was just like referring to more like, you know, an alpha, you know, maybe there's like an alpha build or something even a little bit earlier than that. And that kind of content is then getting spread across the community. But the example you gave right now is like really early where, you know, you didn't even have like the concept, but then you build the community around, okay, this is the game we want to build. Let's like, get an interest group set up and yeah. then make the pitch and then, you know, uh, kind of uh, evolve them into the game community or the kind of, you know, founding members of that game community itself. So that, that's pretty and tactically, 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 like getting started with something like that. It's like very easy, right? Like you just need to be willing to share something and like try to understand an audience and like what they care about. So we started that like for co-op gamers, right? We, We built a big binder, like on Google Docs or whatever, um, that just listed a bunch of different co-op games, right? And we went into those different subreddits and we started just posting, like literally, it was the same post on every single subreddit. It said, why why is Deep Rock Galactic the best online co-op game? 
why is Gunfire Reborn the best online co-op game? Why is Sea of Thieves the best online co-op game? Why is, you know, and, and, like literally in all of these communities. And what we saw is tons of people commenting on this stuff, right? We then DM them on Reddit, said, hey, we're building this game concept. We thought your opinion was really awesome, right? Thank you for sharing. Can you come join this Discord community and be active participant, right? Meet other people that share similar thoughts to you, right? We didn't have to make any content to do that. All we did was post, you know, a really simple Reddit headline that said, why do you think this game is amazing? Once we start, once we built this like smaller audience of people that we knew were you know, into co-op games, right? We started expanding that into roguelikes. So we created a roguelike, fake roguelike influencer on Imgur called Spritesicle. Um, and all Spritesicle would do would take different, co- different roguelike games um, that were trending on Steam, uh, find their trailers on YouTube, download their trailers and repost them on TikTok, uh, sorry, on Imgur and tell people, hey, I'm giving away X copies of this game this week, right? We had like a $50 budget or something like every week. Um, and those posts just went insanely viral. Like that creator had, I think, close to 3 million views over four months um, when we were basically just building this audience of roguelike evangelists and we didn't have to make any unique content to do it. So we just had an opinion on you know, where we wanted to go with our game. We had a, 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 an ever clarifying opinion on who our target audience was going to be and funneled all those people into for us a discord but you know we very easily could have done like an email newsletter or something what we really wanted was you know people that we could share our game with uh people that could actively give us great feedback and tell us why what we've built is wrong um and why you know what are the different co-op things in particular that they that they were looking for. What are the specific roguelike things that are that are there in particular? We learned a ton through that process. Like the people we interviewed had like 15 roguelike games in their Steam library, right? They told us overwhelmingly every great roguelike games game that comes out. I'm looking to I'm looking to play, right? 20, 30 bucks. I'm willing to buy that because it's going to give me a ton of value. I know it's replayable, right? I can play this for 100 hours. And the co-op gamers had a you know sim- similar type of behavior where they have kind of a lineup of co-op games that they play with their friends, maybe on a weekly or you know bi-weekly basis. And you need to find a way to get your game inserted into their into their lives, right? Um, but they owned a ton of co-op games as well. So they're always looking for new things to basically add, right? It's like the new bar that's opened across the street that you're going, going to with your friends, like, hey, I'm gonna go check this out. It's like the new co-op game that everybody is excited about. You know, people are gonna go buy it and share it with their friends. So we learned a lot through that through that early process talking to people. Um, it's super impactful for us to have a very very clear pitch to you know publishers at, at GDC back in 2021, I think, uh, when we did right. it. So yeah, it was dope. All right, great. Yeah, I think uh, I think I think that's like a good 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 breakdown, good examples. And I guess yeah, timing. What I'm hearing is you know essentially uh, timing for a community launch comes down to first of all readiness, uh, which can be in terms of resources, you know, content, um, the team, uh, etc. Time, uh, but the second part is also just the goals. You know, uh, if you want to like create a community to gather initial feedback, or you want to create a community to share your initial builds, or you know you want to create a community to kind of spread the word uh, about the game that you have so probably readiness and goals is kind of what i'm hearing but let's uh, let's go ahead and you know add up like a y axis uh, to the entire spectrum um so you know this one is uh, a size versus quality uh, spectrum so you know one extreme is of course like uh, uh, the size of the community how big it is how small it is and the other extreme is you know the quality of the community itself so you don't have like all the people but you have like you know you're kind of optimizing for engagement uh, and such um, but yeah Colin what what do you think is kind of the right balance to achieve on this axis what are kind of the you know again criteria to consider when thinking about size versus quality and again more tactically you know how does one control for both size and quality without making too many enemies in the community too soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's just, the, the enemies thing is hilarious. We have, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, especially if you're trying to grow aggressively, you can rub some people the wrong way because usually the way you grow is you go into other people's communities and you kind of, you know, usually talk to the owners of it and kind of, you know, borrow their audience for a bit. But, uh, but yeah, let's talk kind of size versus quality. So 
The important part about community work, especially because it's so hype driven right now and kind of buzzwordy is to like always push back to like, why are you building your community? What company problem are you solving with your community? And usually that'll answer your size versus quality, right? You know, what stage are you at? Are you trying to gain confidence in a game? You know, maybe the right 10,000 people who are like total tastemakers in the space, if they love what you're building or you understand what makes them tick, that's enough. You've succeeded in your goals, right? Um, you have access to that audience. So that would be that stage one. Stage two, you're going to talk to publishers, right? Like think backwards, right? If I have a bunch of people who are excited for this game, you know, what is going to help me tell a good story of, of this being a product that needs to be made, right? Of this being de-risked because there's an audience who already loves it, right? And then, you know, maybe this is a much more exciting and meaningful question though when we get to that third stage, which is I'm launching my title, right? In the next six to nine months, I want to build and grow a community to help me win. Um, and the answer there is like, what makes a community member good, right? Um, I think, you know, having a huge community of low engaged people the problem is when you're in that growth stage, you're going to be counting on that community to come in and make every social media asset that you post, right? Every trailer that you post successful. And so if you have 500,000 people, but they're not showing up, they're not engaging, they're not what we call activating, who cares, right? And I, and I think that actually has burned a lot of VCs <laughs> because, because they go like, oh, there's 250,000 people in this community. It must be great. And we're like, why? Like, why? Right. Well, what? They're, just, they're not doing anything. Um, and so then, you know, let's go to the other side, right? I mean, if you have 5,000 people who are ride or die and they're massively engaged and they're talking with each other, you know, that might not be enough, right? You might not be getting what you need, whether it's playtesting feedback, you know, or amplification, right? Or word of mouth. I mean, fundamentally, the amount of word of mouth that can come out of 5,000 people, you know, you're going to have less of a cap than if you have 50,000 or 500,000. So, yeah, you know, I would say... Really, we're talking about kind of inducing word of mouth. We're talking about driving your K factor up. If you're going to be in that third stage launching with your community, you know, think about a metric that is a function of quality and size. What are they doing for me? Right. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it. Awesome. That, that makes a lot of sense. I guess we can then finally add up like a, a, a Z or a Z axis uh, that more represents maybe the platforms and uh, and or business models and try to kind of connect it back also to the other axes. So, Richard, how does community launch time thinking kind of change for, you know, a PC console game versus a mobile free to play one versus Web3 or, you know, uh, the other access was size versus quality. So how does, you know, the size versus quality balance change across, you know, the same platforms? Um, yeah, maybe maybe we can start there. Yeah. Uh, so out of the ones that you just outlined, like I think PC console um, generally are, you know, I would say generally are more social people um, on platforms like Discord um, or Reddit even. Uh, so that, that group of people is, is incredibly social. So if you can build a big community uh, of you know, PC console gamers, uh, let's say PC maybe it's as, as a start, um, that I think is a, is a huge success for you. Um, you know, so I would optimize more for having a big community of people that I know are in my target audience. Um, in terms of like when to get that started, I think uh, I, I think generally, again, if you're an indie studio, you should start that now. If you're a big studio with huge marketing plans, right, uh, that you know are going to drive the actual, you know, an actual target audience to your game, you have a, just a little bit more leeway, I think, in terms of when you want to launch your community. That being said. You, you still can build a community around an unannounced title, right? Say who you are as a, as a studio, build a community around that. And th those people can come and amplify, you know, the bigger launches in the future. Um, so I, I think it's kind of a, yeah, kind of like a open-ended answer, but that's what I would say for, for PC console. Like uh, actually just more so for PC, I think console is like a lot less social on, on platforms like Discord, that you know, Discord, for example, has an integration with PlayStation now. But you know, we just don't see that many people in our communities that that we manage that are exclusively console gamers. A lot of PC gamers, a lot of mobile gamers as well. Uh, for mobile studios, I think um, I think it's a little bit. I think it's a little tricky. Um, I think it's tricky to launch communities. Um, they have like a their own kind of like go to market plans in terms of doing soft launches and really testing ad spend. Um, and I think that is very valuable for them, uh, mainly because they want to see what, you know, the 
LTV to CAC looks like, the payback period looks like. Um, and that's not necessarily something that, you know, your community is going to be able to give you clean data on. Like it's better to go run an ad test. I think for PC, those, me- those metrics, especially if it's a premium title, uh, for Web3 games um, as a whole, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but Web3 games, you know, are have done a really, really good job of finding ways to build community early. Uh, and, you know, the biggest one is through PFP projects, I would say, uh, where community members have a shared identity. Maybe those assets that they, you know, buy or get for free, um, maybe those assets end up being used in the game. And I think that's a really, really great strategy to retain people for longer, right? They feel like they have buy-in to the you know, final product. I have a ship in this game or a character in, in this game that's you know, unreleased. I don't know too much about it, but I'm still excited about it because I have some sort, some sort of upside, some sort of you know, cool, cool item that's going to be used in there. Maybe it's rare or legendary. Right. Um, so Web3 games, I think, have... Um, have done a really good job of, of ultimately giving assets early, building identity around their projects. Um, so they, right. they tend to do it much, much earlier than, than traditional gaming companies. Right, makes sense. And I guess on the mobile side also, you know, uh, I guess not all mobile games have a community, but there are also like some clear examples of both games and companies that have, you know, prioritized community. Uh, one more I mean, I, I guess we can call it slightly recent, maybe over the last five, five, six years. Um, Calibri Games with Idle Miner Tycoon, you know, uh, they these were also like, you know, four, I think four or five uh, college students uh, who essentially built out the product uh, through community feedback. And, you know, it like really, really helped them. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, with the bigger uh, $100 million budgets, you have MiHoYo uh, and the HoYo yeah. and, you know, how they kind of sustain their communities. Uh, but yeah, I, I think overall, uh, it's definitely tricky. The importance of, you know, community feels like, yeah, feels like uh, more of a focus on the Web3 uh, and PC console sides versus mobile. But yeah, also, yeah, there are opportunities in mobile, I guess. Um, definitely. But, but I, definitely opportunities in mobile. Mm-hmm. I just think it's, um, it just feels like uh, mobile games have like a very, I would say, a much uh, similar, um, maybe simplistically, like a much more rigid go to market approach versus like PC console games. Um, and because they have that, you know, they have that approach that's, you know, been proven out over, over a long run, um, they're much more willing to stick with it. So I think the opportunity is clearly there for studios on the mobile side that want to build community, right? Yeah, we've worked with a couple of mobile um, apps mostly for a focus on like testing on Apple test flight, things like that. Um, and that's been very successful. So it's not, it's not like mobile doesn't have the, the tools to build community. It's more, you know, mobile games in particular, you know, they want to test scaled ad costs, right. understand LTVs and customer acquisition costs and payback periods. And there's a kind of a framework to do that. Um, right. yeah. That's separate from community. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, it kind of comes back to the goals uh, part of it, but but yeah, that that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are no more uh, reasonable uh, axes left. Uh, but the question of resources uh, to fund community building, uh, engagement, growth, and you know, management efforts always exists. Um, Colin, maybe you could quickly go over you know what does successful community building on a shoestring budget look like. And then on the other end, um, you know, what does it look like for the more like top five kind of gaming companies of the world or in the world? Yeah, I mean, yet again, it has to come back to goals, right? So you're an indie studio. What stage are you at, right? Have you decided what game you're going to build yet? Are you going to hunt down a publisher, right? Like, I think the big question I always ask of like indies and especially some of these like very venture-backed startups is like, you can see a lack of clarity in their goals because they might be sitting there and putting 99% of their budget into development, right? And none of their budget into community. And I'm not saying you need to put all of your money into community, but like, what is the actual outcome here? Is it connecting with users and showing that there's an audience who loves this? So you can go do a bunch of sweet BD deals to go, you know, boost your launch. Is it to launch in a massive way? And so, you know, if I could reframe your question, I think it's less like, what does community look like in a shoestring budget? But the first question is like, 
what is a good split and how you spend your money to get your studio to your next set of goals. And that is something that indie studios and even if venture backed studios have raised a lot of money, they need to act like indie studios, right? Because they're, they're existentially, they're, they, you don't have a product in the market. You're an indie studio essentially. Right. Um, but yeah, you know, I would say on a shoestring budget, you're, you're going to be, you know, like, like it's, it's who you hire, who you bring on, right? You could bring on someone like us and we can come in and do really targeted work, help you get clarity of strategy uh, and work, but we're probably not going to be shoestring, shoestring, shoestring. So maybe what this is, is actually going and finding someone who is in a really upstanding member of the community and the audience you want to go tackle and bringing them on part-time to go build interests and to like manage a small community around your game. That can be great for indie folks, right? Um, yet again, that person is going to be like a native from the audience that you need to win with to win financially, ultimately, right? Or you need to win with to go get, you know, a publishing deal done. And those people also, the hardest problem with community is you're going to have people who are good at managing the community and people who are good at growing the community. And when you talk shoestring, shoestring, you're trying to find that unicorn who can do both, right? If you can go pull someone from a community who already has a little black book or already has all the relationships and connections, that can be a really frugal, economical way to go in there and get started, right? Big companies. Um, yeah, big companies like massively, massively underinvest in community. Yet again, there's three existential questions that you have to answer as a game studio. Am I building the right game, right? Do I have the traction I need to get this game like fully funded or you know, all the resources it needs to launch? And then am I launching strong? I think we overwhelmingly see a lot of big studios these days building the wrong games, right? You know, it's the creative director's baby. It's the game that the, the, the company that the team wants. And then there's no matching audience for it. Like no amount of marketing, no amount of product time or budget uplift will solve that problem. Right. And I think, you know, in the, in, in the industry, we always joke about this with our friends with Rebeer. We're like, who, you know, <laughs> three years ago, maybe this made sense, but who is this for? So for those studios, like they need to be getting closer to communities. They need to be probably putting into their red light, green light process. Um, when it comes to getting funding there, that's going to be usually for big studios an internal red light, green light. You know, I, I think for them, those, those people who are building those early play tests and prototypes they need to be comfortable sharing them, not because they want to share something horrible with the world or they want to hurt brand value, but because yet again, players tell us what is good. We, we, the best game designer in the world can't call his shot. They're not Babe Ruth, right? Um, and then I think stu big studios are massively underinvesting in community, you know, going into launch just because all of the normal things that incumbents had access to are getting less efficient. So the programmatic ad spend, like Apple did ATT, right? Like you're not getting as much juice out of that as, as you were before. If you're a big studio and if influencers know you have deep pockets, they're going to either ask for all of your money or they're going to ask for carry in the game, right? And you're kind of caught with your hands up. Um, you're fighting for less and less and less attention. So I think it's existentially important that you figure out how to get more attention out of your captured fans, right? Now, what does that actually look like? Best in class is going to be MiHoYo, right? Um, what they've essentially done is built a custom web hub. They have all of these huge scaled socials like Discord, like Reddit, like Imgur. Um, they've spent money growing those. So they have these huge, huge, huge social platforms. We know that because we actually were approached by them and did some community growth work for them through one of our Discord bots. Nice. Um, but you know, now they have this like kind of central hub and they're pushing all of these users in there. And in there they can put up quests and rewards and induce kind of mass action from those fans. They're also gathering data, right? And so the is ultimate that, is that form the Hoyo lab you're talking about? Yes, Hoyo Labs. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And so yeah, to, to, to keep it short, right? Um, what they're essentially doing is going in there and they have these big levers they can pull, quests they can put out there, daily rewards, and they can induce behavior from these huge scale socials they have, right? You know, everyone from the Discord and the game is all coming into Hoyo Lab. And then they're also capturing data, right? Data that informs their marketing and lets them do those normal big company marketing things more efficiently, right? Know your yeah. user not only helps you get them to drive more K-factor organic, but it's going to help let you go, you know, spend influencer money better. You know, know the right medium-sized influencers to tackle know which people you want to partner with on Twitter. So, right. yeah, that, that's kind of integrating community fully into your go-to-market, and that's what big companies need to do. Right. Makes sense. Yeah, that that's uh, super valuable insights over there. And I think it also kind of dovetails quite well into the next question, you know, kind of moving away from the more theoretical and strategic topics, but, you know, uh, 
let's talk about you know who's the best person uh, or partner for the job maybe richard uh, you could you could uh, you know give us some insight into you know when is a good time to hire a community manager or a community management partner um, and also you know what should one kind of be looking for and testing for and if you have any immediate red flags <laughs> that would, that that would be good to know too yeah colin could definitely add on here as well um uh, especially especially around like red flags i think that'd be kind of funny um to hear his opinion on it but in terms of like bringing a community manager on either like onto your team or a community team onto your team um i think it it's in line with you know when you're going to be launching your community or set of communities like maybe one or two months before so they can get actively integrated into the marketing plans um i think that's really really important So just depending on when you want to launch your community that's the time to go find you know a, you know a community manager uh a community hire a community team or you know engage with somebody like Winwalk um usually about like a month before something you know is something major is launching um in terms of finding the right people Colin kind of mentioned this uh earlier but we see a lot of legacy community managers i guess is the way to put it um whose main job has been really customer service um what they do is they help people you know you know figure out login issues or you know maybe they didn't get credited the right you know xp or currencies on their accounts or whatever and they basically act as a funnel you know directly from the community to the eng team to make things uh to to remediate whatever the issue is that's certainly like a piece of the work right and having like somebody that can actively talk to your community members in a kind manner and respectful manner very very important um but what you really want is somebody that can push you know for the different community initiatives that you're looking to you know looking to uh looking to deploy so across the life cycle you know can someone actively manage playtesting for you right are they going to be able to do things like select users send them steam keys uh or you know send them access codes etc and create excitement around that inside the community are they going to be able to leverage gating right and scarcity to go find different creator partners or community partners to actually amplify you know everything that you're doing um and so i think what we see is a lot of people that have worked in community in the past very much are focused on customer support and feel good vibes inside of a discord uh and they have generally lost sight or have not been managed appropriately to to actively push community as a strategic goal i i i think that's kind of the the long and short of it in terms of finding somebody great it's will that person be able to drive the strategic initiatives that we need for our community whether that be activation playtesting feedback general engagement etc in terms of red flags I think something that um I think something that's very clear clearly a red flag for for hiring a community manager somebody that doesn't know your product doesn't love your game. Um you need somebody that you know is actively able uh willing and able to dive deep into the product so that they can have conversations with people that are spending 50 100 hours playing it, right? Yeah, maybe. you know if if, yeah. if that person doesn't know the meta, right? how can they actively be a community manager for you right they need to be playing the game a ton uh they need to understand what people's complaints are you know and and how to actively remediate them etc so uh it's very clear when somebody just kind of like doesn't know the product um and doesn't care to know the product that's a huge red flag i think the second red, red flag is somebody that's not willing to experiment and learn right community community is an amalgamation of people and people all have their own different incentives and are working in different you know basically communities almost rip, almost never are are marching in lockstep so community managers need to be able to experiment and do things um and test and learn a lot inside their communities this could be testing tons of different live events to run um or doing things like let's say you're running a play test and your team has been having a conversation around Hey, you know, once we release this game, what do live ops look like? Do we think players are going to attach more to characters or weapons? Okay, let's run a play test where let's introduce a new character and see how many people show up to that and play with the new character versus a play test where we introduce a new weapon, see how many people play with that and what the feedback is that, that comes out of it, how excited are people, 
So I think it's, it's somebody that is very much willing to learn and experiment, understands the product really deeply, um, and can honestly have, have real meaningful conversations with people. Um, those are the things that, that matter the most. Colin, any red flags from you? No, I think like summary right there, you know, Mandy, the framework you had was size and quality, right? To, to summarize what Richard said, the first red flag is they can't grow your community. And that's where we see legacy community people. Like I've been a community expert for 15 years working at EA on a game that's scaled up by a marketing department. If you're a startup or you're a, a, like, a, like a, you know, a venture-backed company, a game studio, and your community's five people, that person can't fundamentally help you. So don't hire them, right? Now, yet again, to Richard's point, the second red flag and maybe less egregious one is someone who can grow your community like crazy, right? Um, but they don't know anything about your product and the quality of your community suffers because it kind of feels artificial right. and you know, everything a community shouldn't feel. Um, and so like, I would say they're both red flags. You know, a community person early on where you can't hold them to a growth goal is going to be 90% of the problems we run into. 10% are going to be quality. Yet again, that's why I'm saying that unicorn hire for someone who's on a budget is find that person who's a lunatic who knows all the influencers in your genre, right? <laughs> um, and bring them on because their initial chunk of growth is just going to be their little black book and they're going to be indisputably experts, right? So that's all like very wise advice. Uh, so that's great. Um, so we're, we're kind of running up on time. So, you know, let's start looking into the future a bit, start looking forward a bit. Uh, so, you know, Colin, looking forward, and this is going to be a slightly big question, but uh, it's a, it's a kind of we we have to look into our crystal ball a bit. So you know, looking forward, what is the future of uh, community management and games? You know, can I'm just going to throw out like a bunch of uh, examples and trends over here, but you know, can AI act as an exoskeleton of sorts uh, for community managers? And how? What does the rise of UGC mean for community management? Do content creator programs, you know, have a role to play in community management? Uh, I'm probably missing out on a few angles over here, but these were top of oh, mind. Right. But yeah, you know, to kind of summarize, it'll be great if you could kind of talk about what you find the most interesting and exciting as we kind of go into 2024. Totally. Yeah. So let's start with AI because AI is like everyone's, every VC's favorite topic, right? They always bring it up at the end of meetings. That's yeah. fine. The thing that like the biggest problem that communities run into, I think, is scale. Right, the communities are inherently like authentic places to hang out with people, and I think that the scaling problems that communities have are very similar to scaling problems that Twitch channels have. You know, we follow someone. On, you know, you follow someone on Twitch. There's 30 people in chat. You're talking in chat. The person is talking back to you, right? The streamer, and that's a really cool product. And then overnight, they blow up, and they have 3,000 people in chat. And the product that you loved completely changed. Now chat is just flying by a million messages a second, and you probably go and find someone new to watch. Communities have that same problem, right? Like they're fundamentally different when they're small, medium, and large. And I think AI can help with that. Now, we have met some people who are doing a very, very bad approach at this. There are some people who are like, we've built artificial community members so things can feel a lot, you know, small communities can feel big or they can feel authentic. And we're like, eh, gross. No, right? Like it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's pretty dystopian, right? Um, but I would say, you know, AI is going to help in three, in three ways. One is just the volume of, data coming out of communities is hard to deal with. And so there are AI solutions that can help you understand the sentiment of your community. You know, when it was 100 people, you just go in and ask them what's good or you see when they're pissed. You know, when it's 10,000, 100,000, 200,000 people, you're going to need a little helping hand there. Um, two, managing members of a community at scale, right? Not making fake community members to engage, but like, hey, if we want to run a community program that was easy to run with 100 people, how do we scale that out to 1,000, 10,000 people, right? Um, Chatbots are a good example of that. You answer all the questions, the FAQs your users have, then you build an FAQ question, then you build a chatbot, right? That's going to respond to those questions for people. Um, so I think AI is very promising in that area, right? Um, and then there's a lot of cool AI projects that are built like natively into their community, something like a mid journey, right? It's a discord bot. People are talking while they're creating stuff. There's no air gap between community and their product. So that's kind of its own interesting area. Um, I would say what we're really excited about, though, is, I mean, it's, it's our product. It's what we're building, right? But which is like, how do you drive mass behavior at scale from communities, right? And you could view this in a negative way, right? Some people are like, oh, it feels like botting. But the answer really is that members of your community right now want to help. The reason they're in the community is that they're excited about your product and they want it to grow. When we were building our first game, the sentiments in there was like, we can't wait for this game to blow up. We were here first, right? Um, like. But with the way discoverability algorithms work these days, 
how can you better get your community who is passionate to show up at the right time and place for that discoverability algorithm to recognize how passionate your fandom is, right? That's the way to think about it. And so we're really bullish on essentially like large scale community rewards, platforms that like pull essentially your community members together from all the disparate platforms. Because you might have a lot of people on Twitter and a lot of people on Discord. But as we mentioned earlier, this is the definition of community. That's all your community. It might just be inefficient because they're in two different places, right? So um, yeah, I think that's the kind of like where we see a lot of the excitement. I mean, community is a very hands-on manual thing early on. And like AI and this tooling will let us still have that power even when we're at huge scale and we can't be hands-on, right? I think Colin covered it for the most part. There are a couple of really good examples like um, of people, I think, using AI interestingly inside their communities. Um, one of them is actually a client of ours called AI Arena. They're making like a Web3 platform fighting game uh, where you train an AI and the AI fights with, with another trained AI and there's like big prizes and stakes. It's really cool. Um, they have, you know, a, 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 they have kind of a mascot character like Paimon type, type thing for, for Genshin, but it's called Agnes and it's a little robot. And, you know, we basically did this, um, you know, Agnes now, you know, users can summon Agnes to answer frequently asked questions inside the community, right? And that's a really, really simple, you know, way in which AI chatbots can, can help. Um, I don't think simulating like user, actually AI simulating users is going to work. Like people ultimately want to connect with other real people. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily like the, the move. I, I think where what we're what we're kind of nudging up against um, is there's a huge lack of tooling for community management in this world. Um, whether it be managing like your Twitter or your Discord or your Reddit, all these places have native management tooling, um, but they also have like APIs that you can build cool stuff on top of. Um, and users are choosing to spend their time in places that they feel are cool and unique. And so I think there's a huge opportunity to build interconnection between social platforms um, and a huge opportunity to build tools that allow CMs to do their jobs uh, much more easily. You know, a legacy Discord event would be, a legacy Discord event would be, for example, I wanna create a mini game. I need to go talk to my engineering team and build a bot, right? Uh, for for how somebody can, for example, you know, do a little clicker mini game, right? We've built out modules in our own tech that allow you to deploy a mini game that's themed and configurable to your community in less than thirty seconds, right? Where you could users can basically have like a boss raid and you know, kill a boss or whatever and get get cool rewards for doing it. Um, and so there's a big opportunity there to take existing behavior that has been really really manual and difficult for community managers to resource internally. Um, and build technologies that allow them to basically just give them superpowers. So that's, that's what I'm really, really excited about. Um, and obviously that's, that's something that we're, we're actively working on. So, um, it's just it came from a place of us working on so many different communities, us working on our own communities that me having to go to the engineering team to build something custom every single time and taking up their time. We're trying to take up our clients' time to build a really cool integration just isn't good enough, right? But a lot of times there's no resources for it. So we need to build something better that we know can work off the shelf for anybody, whether they be an indie studio or a AAA publisher. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm really excited about. Awesome. Right. Yep. I, th I think yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and yeah, definitely very exciting. Uh, maybe I heard hints of a Windwalk GPT uh, in 2024, but I guess we'll see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll All right. Uh, some weird AI product. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. So yeah, I guess to kind of, you know, top it off, um, Final question, you know, if there's one game's community launch engagement and growth strategy you'd recommend everyone to study, uh, which one would it be and why? Number one would be this game called Spellbreak that launched a couple of years ago. Uh, Spellbreak was like a battle royale with magic elements, so kind of like Fortnite, but you float and shoot magic at people. Um, they did a really great, they had kind of a really great community growth angle uh, where they started posting for their playtesting on Imgur. And it's very, I think a great, I think it's a very good case study for people working on PC games in particular to look at how you can grow a natural and organic community around your title. 
spell break would be a really good one. I think I'm seeing some early signs of spell break in a project called, uh, sorry, in a project called um, Project Loki from Theorycraft. I think they're doing a very, very good job of curating their community right now um, and actively testing things. You know, I, uh, I just saw a video from them the other day where their community manager or, or somebody on their community team, I actually don't remember who it was, was basically going through like this next update, we're adding this cool, crazy thing. Don't set your expectations too high, but we really want feedback on it. And it was very, very clear, you know, they're willing to test crazy things inside their game with their community of fans that they feel confident aren't just going to leave the game because they added this like crazy new meta into it. Um, and so I think they're doing a really good job. If, if somebody is launching like a PC game right now, look at what Theorycraft is doing actively, study that one. And if you want to kind of get a good sense of what Theorycraft is doing and what paved the way for Theorycraft to do this, take a look at Spellbreak and see what they did back in 2019 uh, 2020 era. I think um, that's definitely on the PC side. I think on the Web3 side, uh, definitely Digi Daigaku and what Limit Break is doing is really, really interesting. Um, and we're really lucky to be a part of that. Uh, it's been just a great honor to serve on that one. Um, so, you know, basically creating memes and building a cult like atmosphere um, in there is, is a big thing. Um, and I, I'd say a couple of other projects that seemingly have done this very well on the Web3 side. Things like Pudgy Penguins um, that just did like a big Walmart launch um, and probably Azuki as well that, you know, built a huge, you know, really high, really high quality brand identity around, uh, really high quality brand identity around, um, you know, their art and anime and really targeted a great group of people to join their, their community. But right. um yeah, I think I think those are some some interesting examples to go look at. Yeah, I think I think there's there's definitely a lot of noise in the market because of games like Among Us that feel like so community oriented, but in reality just kind of like grew up and then built a big community after that. Those aren't really great case studies to see what like an active community go to market looks like. Something like Spellbreaker right. Theorycraft is going to be way way better. Um, yep, yeah, and if you need more, ask Windwalk. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I caveat about the games like Among Us. That's a pretty important caveat. Uh, a lot of people kind of forget about that uh, point. But but awesome. Um, I think I think that's also a great place to you know end our discussion for today. So thanks again, you know, Colin and Richard for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been definitely a real pleasure having you on. And I still feel like we really only scratched the surface over here. So maybe there should be a part two uh, where we get deeper into different topics around community. But if listeners uh, would like to connect with you, um, you know, or work with you uh, on their community strategy or learn more about Winwalk's uh, big 2024 plans, how can they do so? Uh, yeah, I would say just shoot me an email at colin at winwalk.com. We're we're uh, we're still scrappy enough that we use our personal emails. We probably probably should fix that. But yeah, I mean, we we're always down to talk to anyone. Um, we you know, I think Richard and I probably spend half of our week talking with people. You know, not not eat like pro bono, just kind of trying to make sure that they have good community goals set in place. They're working on the right things, um, and you know, we want everyone to you know use the power of community and succeed. So yeah, everyone should just reach out and let's chat. All right. And Richard, how about you? Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me uh, Richard at winwalk.com for an email. You can find me at Babushka Boy on Discord and uh, <laughs> Babushka Boy also on Twitter. So Perfect. I'm a big ASAP Rocky fan. So I uh, had to had to co-opt the name, but it fits me. <laughs> yep. um, uh, fits me. I've been running with it for a couple of years. So yeah, you know, we're, we're basically perpetually online. Um, important for us to, to do so and also keep an eye on what projects, not just our own projects, but what other projects are doing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, very open to conversation with people. So just reach out. Sounds good. Awesome. And to our listeners, uh, thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed the conversation, do let me know uh, as we'll kind of catch you in the next episode in a couple of weeks for more insightful conversations. Until then, all the best from the three of us uh, with setting up your game community efforts for success. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. 
And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.